Um, next, we are fortunate to have two very special guests with us, two very incredible women. Um, first, I'd like to e introduce FTC Commissioner Terrell McSweeney. Uh, Commissioner McSweeney was sworn in at the Federal Trade Commission in April of 2014 and to a term that expires in September of next year. Although, as I heard in an event earlier this week, let's not remind ourselves of that. <laughs> Prior to joining the commission, she served as chief counsel for competition policy and intergovernmental relations for the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. Commissioner McSweeney and her time at the FTC has prioritized both protecting kids and improving data security while at the FTC. And as we've been hearing at this conference, the nexus between the two is especially important. She's also been vocal and a leader about the need to protect the ability of white hat hackers to test for vulnerabilities and for IoT companies to prioritize data security in order to enhance consumer trust in their nascent industry. I'm also very pleased to introduce the co-head of Hogan Level's privacy and security practice, Julie Brill. Prior to this position, she was a longtime public servant, most recently as FTC commissioner from April 2010 until March of this year. Julie is without question a globally recognized expert on privacy, security, consumer protection, and antitrust. And if you search for her name, you'll often find her described with phrases like top mind and game changer. Thankfully, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good description. Thankfully for all of us, she is still a frequent speaker and author on emerging privacy and cybersecurity issues. Julie will moderate this discussion and hopefully we'll have some time for questions from the audience as well. And just one more thing I forgot to mention, please do uh, tweet while you're at the conference. The hashtag, I believe, is FOSI2016, but let's keep the conversation online as well as here in the room. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was me who said, let's not remind ourselves of when your right. term yeah, is up earlier this conference week. conference in you, one week. So. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. So um, we just heard Jules talk about this wonderful work um, that uh, FPF and FOSI have done to put together a paper talking about connected toys and COPPA and all of that it, it, at a high level before we dive into the details. Obviously, there are incredible benefits to you know, connected toys and to all of these services that are going to be um, helping kids and children, and also, of course, some privacy and security issues. So tell me, as a commissioner, um, you know, how do you think about balancing the benefits and the risks, and, and what do you see as your role in helping that conversation go forward? Uh, well, first of all, I want to just say thank you so much uh, to FOSI and also to Jules for the, the very helpful paper um, that he just presented on this morning. And to you, Julie, for, for moderating this conversation. Sure, it's great to be able to have time to sit down with you and have a discussion again. Um, you know, I am a federal trade commissioner, but I'm also a parent of a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. So these issues are sort of in real time playing out in my family and household in a way that um, I think, I suspect is, is actually an experience that a lot of us in the room share. So on the one hand, I try to think about how do we balance the right approach to protecting kids' security and privacy and giving parents meaningful choices um, and in a regulatory and enforcement-based model against um, also my own experiences as a parent. And so um, I wanted to call out a few things in, in what we just heard. Mm -hmm. One, that I think COPPA can apply, and I think that's a really important takeaway from, from the paper. Um, I think another important um, aspect of it is providing parents with meaningful choices in an environment where we aren't necessarily engaging with a screen and providing them with some sort of information at the point of sale. I think that's a recommendation in the report that is a really meaningful one. Um, because it's, it's not simply whether you're COPPA compliant, I think, that matters here. I think it also matters generally in whether parents are going to buy this technology, whether they can trust it. Um, and, you know, the minute we have a connected toy DDoS attack on, you know, a network or connected home, I think we're going to see a very different response to this kind of technology and a lot more sensitivity to it. Um, let alone, you know, even creepier invasions of, of privacy of the home. So I, I think it's really important as a foundational issue in building consumer trust in the technology. Mm -hmm. yeah, in some ways, it's interesting because connected toys that do come under COPPA provide 
you know, much, the, the, there's an ability to provide so much more protection than, it, than there might be for other connected devices and whatnot. I mean, having verifiable parental consent. COP actually has a security requirement in it too. Most people don't talk about that, but it is, it is also part of COPPA. So in many ways that, that really create, that raises the bar for these products that, where that bar doesn't necessarily exist, at least in law, for other connected products. So COPPA compliant um, uh, uh, connected toys would be terrific, but what else should parents be thinking about, right? So beyond COPPA, which is of course incredibly important, and Fossey and FPF did a fabulous job putting this paper together because this has been under discussion for a very long time, you know, how do COPPA and connected devices interface? But even beyond that, what do you think parents should be thinking about? when they're shopping for their toys this, this holiday season. <laughs> As I am right As now. As you actually, are, I yes, am. yes. Stop by the, the, tell them the tables outside. I was actually demoing a couple of toys that are on my kids' uh, holiday list. So <laughs> it's very useful for a number of reasons. Um, well, so getting beyond the, the core privacy and security questions, I think there are some larger issues here that get to um, kind of a broader data ethics um, connected smart toy ethical question, right? We have this in a number of contexts as we think about the ways in which we are connecting every aspect of our lives. Um, first of all, uh, you know, if the technology is truly smart and interactive, um, I think uh, we need more information and more study about the impact that that has on developing minds and also the extent to which young children have the ability to even understand and differentiate between uh, that kind of technology and what it is and, and reality. And actually thought that's one of the reasons why calling for more engagement, for uh, engagement at every level of government, but also with researchers and, and with other government agencies that have an interest here, it's actually a really important recommendation that FOSI is making. Because I don't know that we completely understand the impact of, of this kind of technology on, on young people. Um, related to that, and I think this would be more within the FTC jurisdiction, I'm uh, pretty mindful of the ways in which a connected smart toy could be used as a marketing channel directly to children. Um, I, would, I would argue that uh, it may, be, it may be impossible to provide sufficient notice to a child if the connected toy uh, that hasn't been played with in a week pipes up in the toy bin and says, oh gee, uh, Jane, can you please pick me up and play with me? And by the way, I have a new dress that you can get if you just ask your butler, and um, also a new friend that I would really, really like to play with. Why don't we all have a play date? Um, this is maybe genius <laughs> for marketing purposes, but, uh, you know, I, I have a six-year-old. Um, <coughs> it's going to be a very confusing conversation uh, for, for that child to have, and I think we have to be really careful if, if that's the, the scenario that we are in. That's an interesting point, the, the interface between these connected toys and marketing. That's really interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, security of these devices, because I know that that's something that you have thought deeply about and you've, you've really focused on while you've been a commissioner. You know, connected toys are going to be part of the same ecosystem as all the other connected home devices. We've spoken a lot um, at the FTC and elsewhere about the threat vectors that each single device would have into that network of devices. But what um, do you see that might, what is special about connected toys? I mean, is there anything special? Is it the same safety concerns? Or are there additional safety, both data, um, data protection as well as device protection issues when it comes to connected toys? Well, I mean, as you know very well from, from your time at the FTC, um, within the IoT security space, we have looked very carefully at situations in which cameras are turned on in people's bedrooms and in which live feeds of babies are put on the public internet. So. To the extent that we regard the invasion of the home as a very special kind of privacy harm or the publication of you know, live feeds of our children in the public internet as a very special kind of uh, invasion of private space, um, I think that's consistent in, in an area in which toys are, are definitely very intimately connected in our lives. Um, so I think that's an issue. I think there's an additional set of, of um, 
issues here that are the same really as, as in the IoT space, but maybe slightly more complicated because toys are things that our children form relationships with. So for example, in the IoT space right now, we're very concerned about what happens um, and how do you communicate directly with consumers when you decide to stop supporting a connected uh, product, stop patching it early in its product life cycle. So you brick it sooner than a, a co reasonable consumer might expect it to be um, uh, uh, support, or you sort of end its, its security life cycle earlier. Um, and so uh, this is why I thought actually Jules' point about having a Wi-Fi on-off switch may be very important because um, imagine you're bricking, uh, I don't want to call out specific toys, but like cute connected uh, toy cat um, that your kid is in love with um, and it's not supported after two years, is the parent at that point going to just take the toy that is the childhood's friend and throw it away, which is what we would probably recommend you do at that point because you don't want to have insecure things connected to the internet in your home network especially. Um, or is there going to be a way for the parents to, to shut off some of that functionality and keep the... the the toy in a relatively dumb state, but a secure state, mm -hmm. so kind of air gapping it, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and even if they, even if that does happen, I can imagine scenarios where no longer having that relationship in the same way is actually difficult for the child, right? So, what is the consumer expectation, and what are they told when they buy the product about how long it will last? Um, and then uh, how do you make the consumer whole, especially if you don't choose to support the product as long as, as that period of time? So I, I think those are going to be questions that are really challenging. They're going to be challenging for parents. Um, they're going to be challenging for the manufacturers and the sellers of the products who are also going to need to find ways to continue to communicate with their consumers so that if they do have to send patches, those, are, those updates are being made or if they are making a decision about whether to support a product, those consumers are reachable. So that's a great outline, <clears throat> excuse me, of the responsibility that manufacturers may have in this space. What about policymakers? So I don't want to um, catastrophize what the 11th <laughs> Circuit did uh, in the LabMD um, most recent uh, discussion where um, the stay of the consent order was granted. And there was some language in there that really, if, if the 11th, 11th Circuit carries forward with that, um, could really cut to the heart of uh, some of what the FTC has tried to do, not only in the IoT space, but just generally speaking with respect to data security, when the data involved would result in emotional harm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, to a certain extent, what, we were, what we've been talking about when it well, comes yeah, so we're to talking kids. about non-economic harm, exactly. which is the same, the same thing as uh, turning on cameras in bedroom, bedrooms Ex and posting live feeds of children in their play space, et cetera. Exactly. Um, so, what so what should policymakers do, again, whether that uh, uh, theory carries forward in a final decision coming out of the 11th Circuit or just generally speaking? We heard uh, Stephen and Jules talk about, you know, the new administration should put in place a, a, a chief safety officer, right, and put in money to this issue so that we can really enhance safety. And then we have the jurisdictional issues. What would be your checklist <laughs> for, for, for what, what policymakers should be doing in this space? So first of all, I just want to um, commend you for the use of the word catastrophize. I don't know. I said and not catastrophize. <laughs> let's that, not. <laughs> is that even a word? I didn't know. And I agree. Let's not, let's not overreact to the 11th Circuit decision in a, in the, around a stay. Um, I, I think that uh, we will continue to uh, uh, brief in that case and explain our, our point of view and why it has been a relatively unanimously held bipartisan point of view on this topic. Um, I think that the FTC's enforcement-based approach has proved to be a relatively good way of going about um, trying to create a, a kind of a, an incentive for the marketplace to seriously adopt good privacy and security uh, practices around some of these connected products, even absent uh, regulatory requirement to do so. Although, as you point out, COPPA does have a data security and Most people forget about it, but it does. Which is yeah. very important. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
But even if you're in the space of not, not clearly under COP, I think that one would argue that uh, certainly you're under the both uh, state requirements and the general FTC requirement to engage in reasonable security practice, which as you know, um, is, is, a, is a security by design practice, mm -hmm. just as privacy is a privacy by design practice. And I think that leads to this conversation we're having about safety and ethics and governance. These are also, I think, uh, appropriately process-oriented kinds of responsibilities. So um, I suspect if we don't get the balance right, um, there will be much more interest in, in passing stricter requirements as to what your responsibilities are. But if we can engage in a meaningful conversation around what safety by design is, for example, and how that process works organizationally and what the responsibilities are around it, um, there's gonna be a far more, um, I think, uh, reasonable answer when questions arise uh, associated with these products. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's the kind of framework that, that we wanna be able to build in this space, both to allow for innovation, uh, but also to make sure that some of the real harms both to children but also to consumers um, are, are mitigated on the front end rather than ending up in a situation where we have a, a really significant problem and then um, pressure for a much stronger uh, response to it. So I, I do think a lot of convening, a lot of best practices in this area would be very useful at this point. Um, and, and I suspect if they don't, uh, if they don't prove strong enough, um, then we'll see more interest in, in a legislative response as well, and, and perhaps a clarification in some of the areas that are that are murkier. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you, you you don't spend time on the dark web yourself personally, but you I know, know that what you I do. think. <laughs> well, well, oh, that's true. That's true. What you do with your connected toys at night? Who knows? I know, right? <laughs> so no, but. You think a lot about these issues, I know, and you've thought a lot about the fact that, and some people here may be alarmed to hear, that actually children's data is some of the most valuable data on the dark web, in part because parents often don't understand or realize until much, much later that kids' data has been used and compromised and all sorts of things have happened with it. So what would you... Um, recommend to parents? I mean, we've talked about manufacturers, we've talked about policymakers, but what steps can parents take over and above just giving consent and, and monitoring what, um, you know, th their COPPA rights, as it were? What other steps can parents take to protect their kids, to protect the information about their kids? Uh, well, um, I will recommend the Federal Trade Commission table that's right outside the door. We have a lot of really good information there as well. Um, you know, this is actually a really present issue for me as a parent. Right. Um, my children's information is um, is out there. It's been exposed not uh, just through, um, well, through actually three hacks now. So um, the other day I was actually just trying to, uh, uh, it's a situation that was very confusing with some of my daughter's identification information, and I was trying to uh, go through a process of trying to put um, just some kind of alert in the credit reporting process about possible misuse of her identity. Um, this was an incredibly time-consuming process. I only succeeded with one credit reporting agency. The rest were multi-step mail-in forms and things, and phone numbers weren't working properly. And I thought, my goodness, this is, I'm following, I'm a, I'm, <laughs> I'm, this is literally, I'm a federal trade commissioner. I'm following the advice that we have, and this is a really hard process. Right. And in many states, it's not even possible to, to engage in it um, because you, you have no authority to create a credit report, for example, and, and freeze it um, in order to try to protect your kid's identity. So we have a really haphazard approach around protecting children's identities. Um, we don't have a unified uh, federal level ability to really um, give parents uh, the information that they need, especially if their uh, kids' identities are being spoofed in some way that is complicated. So I think this is going to continue to be a really challenging thing for people. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are going to be other challenging problems that I hope don't arise, but I suspect will. 
they will involve you know ransomware on toys and things like that. So <laughs> we have to be um, we have to be mindful of the fact that the security requirement here isn't just some sort of do right by COPPA requirement. It's it gets really to core trust adoption, trust in the brand, and um, and I think it's an incredibly important area. Great. Okay. Yeah, and I, th I think at this point only 20 states have credit freeze laws that allow that require the credit reporting agencies to allow parents to put a freeze on their child's accounts. But uh, even then, it, you right. can easily have pieces and portions of the identity used for fraud in other ways That's that, absolutely. that aren't even detected by uh, them, so. uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think we have, you want to take some questions? Sure, absolutely. Okay, great. Do we have some questions for... Terrell? Okay, yeah. Uh, on the Did you use the microphone? <coughs> Coming to you? Uh, Carl Zabo of NetChoice, thanks again for, for coming. Uh, There's always a great conference, and it's good to hear from experts on this. Uh, two questions. One, and I don't know if it's addressed in the report because I, I haven't had a chance to read it because it's, you know, hot off the presses. But one of the fundamental questions with respect to the kind of internet-enabled devices, if you're anybody like me, uh, so I've got two kids, most likely my son's toys will be passed off to my daughter. What do we do about verifiable parental consent? Is that, is that duplicative? Do I have to give it a second time? As well as what happens when friends come over and play with these toys? Second question is, uh, we are fortunate that we do have a safety commission designed specifically for consumer products, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I was wondering to what extent do, should they be part of the conversation and have they been part of the conversation? Uh, these are two really, really good questions. So let me take the first one first, um, which is, uh, you know, I would say you're going to need to give verifiable consent for, for each child, but um, if you're a parent who's familiar already with having consented in the one, then uh, it would probably be relatively easy because you would understand the mechanism. Uh, or maybe not, depending. But this other question of, of the extent to which other children's um, identifiable information is being collected without their parents' consent is more complicated. And I, I was getting mic'd up during the part where Jules was talking about it, but I suspect what he said is you may actually, in fact, have COPPA issues if you're collecting other children's uh, identifiable information without their parents' consent. And that this is a thing that, um, especially if you have a child-directed product as opposed to a product that's more directed at a general audience, we are going to need to think about. It's the same kind of issue that we confront as parents today. I mean, I personally wouldn't post my my friends' kids on any social network without their consent. It has happened to me where people have put my kids on social networks and their images and, and without my consent, and so I talk to them about why I don't like that. Um, and I think this is going to have to be a conversation that parents are also having among themselves. Um, certainly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up for sure, and I, I think it's an important area both for parents to be educated about um, and then for people to be thinking about how do they handle that information if it's identifiable and therefore uh, COPPA covered. And in some ways, the ambient data issue, which is really what you're talking about, you know, how do you get permissions for ambient data, guests in the home, kids playing with your, uh, friends playing with your kid's toy, um, permeates the IoT ecosystem. I mean, this isn't just an issue with respect to connected toys. Uh, COPPA has an overlay on it because of the verifiable parental consent, but to the extent that um, manufacturers are, and, and uh, uh, others that are collecting information with respect to IoT devices generally are seeking consent from uh, the users, you know, how do you do that for guests in the home? So this is an issue that I think uh, the, you know, manufacturers and others have been thinking deeply about, and, and clearly some best practices are called for. There's no question about that in this space. Um, any, so any? there was a second question oh, yes, there, which the was the, the role the of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Yes. Um, I think it's a great question. I haven't personally talked to them about it. You know, the FTC has been handling privacy and data security cases for about 25 years, and we've been substantially increasing our technical expertise in order to handle these kinds of cases. So we think we understand a lot about this technology. I suspect 
um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission is probably going to need to get smart on it as well. I think it would also be incredibly helpful, and there's some efforts afoot in the broader IoT space to really generate some sort of independent testing and labeling capabilities so that I, as a consumer, could quickly look at a label and understand the privacy and security practice around a device. So there's a project right now that's funded by DARPA that's looking at software and IoT and coming up with um, a kind of like energy saver type of label for what the security <coughs> practices are around it, um, the cyber independent testing security testing lab or something like that. Um, and that's a, that's a step in this direction, but I suspect we are um, going to need uh, you know, something more, especially geared towards toys, so that there's a, there's a quick and easy way for people to be in the big box <laughs> store looking at something or looking at it online and seeing um, what, you know, how, what it's doing and whether it comports with whatever their family policies are around um, privacy and security. Well, will you please join me in thanking Terrell for this incredibly Thanks, great please. conversation, so thank you. Thank you.